Tom Wright, better known in academic circles as N.T. Wright, you are the research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. An author of over 70 books, you are considered a leading scholar in your field of Pauline theology and historical Jesus. And you're a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and thus eminently distinguished in your subject. Did I leave anything important out? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, such a productive person is not without critics, of course. Uh, Trevin Wax of the Gospel Coalition crystallizes the discussion you've started like this. N.T. Wright holds the distinction of being one of the few theologians of our day who regularly contradicts and opposes the liberal wing of the academy, while simultaneously alienating and perplexing many conservatives <laughs> within the reform tradition. I think that's a compliment. <laughs> so, thank you so much for this interview, Professor Wright. Thank you. I, I, should, I should say, I never set out to alienate people, but th there is a particular American dynamic to what Trevin Wax says, which I don't think is reproduced in other parts of the world. And anyway, let those chips fall where they will. Yeah, it happens. Uh, does it matter what we can really know about Jesus historically? As Christians, shouldn't we be satisfied with the Enlightenment idea of private religious experiences, <laughs> the bold money in Jesus? Is there a reason why we should try to combine the domains of history and theology? Yeah, this, this question of history and theology, and especially as focused on Jesus, has been massive over the last 300 years. And it's interesting that it has been over the last 300 years and not the previous 1700 years, because until <clears throat> roughly the 17th or 18th century, most people, whether Christian or non-Christian, assumed that the stories in the Gospels were more or less true. Um, obviously, people in other traditions like Islam would say that Jesus didn't die on the cross and wasn't raised from the dead. But broadly, certainly in European culture, the Gospels were just taken as historical documents. And it was only then in the 17th and 18th century that people started to say, wait a minute, there are some oddities here. And as I look back at that, I think part of the problem was that much Western Christianity had forgotten some of what the Gospels were all about and had translated the kingdom of God coming on earth as in heaven into a kingdom of heaven, meaning Jesus teaching us how to go to heaven with all sorts of things that follow from that so that other things in the Gospels then didn't quite fit. And so the church was just rumbling along doing its own thing and often being quite corrupt, especially in places like France, which, which was notorious in the 18th century for the corruption of the church. And so when the French Revolution happened, that was part of a whole movement that was saying, we think this wretched church thing has got it wrong. And by the way, it's wrong about Jesus. And by the way, we're just going to do some history, history of Jesus and we'll show that Jesus was not what the church has said he was. And he can't have been the son of God. He didn't die for the sins of the world. He was just a Jewish reformer or something like that. So <clears throat> the, the, the present mood of saying, hang on, Jesus, history, faith, how does all that work, <clears throat> goes back to a turbulent time in European cultural, political, social life, out of which really what we think of as the modern European world has emerged, and with it, rather uncomfortably, the question of Jesus. Now, before the Second World War, there were many, particularly in Germany, which was the field leader in, in uh, critical study of the New Testament, who really thought we couldn't know very much about Jesus. They'd looked at some of the models on offer and they said, they're all so odd and contradictory, we really can't, and what's more, we don't really need that because what matters is one's faith today rather than something that happened 2,000 years ago. After the Second World War, one of the great German scholars of the day, Ernst Käsemann, said, sorry, we do need historical Jesus' work because he had seen that the Nazis in the 1930s had invented uh, a, a non-Jewish Jesus and were trying to say that Jesus himself was above all that Jewish stuff for obvious political reasons in Germany, that they wanted to be able to say, let's get rid of the Jews, but let's keep somebody we will call Jesus. And Kaiserman rightly said, unless we are constantly going back and anchoring Jesus in who he really was, then we are at the mercy of any ideology that chooses to make Jesus in its own image to serve its own ends. So for political reasons, really, social and political reasons, the, the, his, the historical Jesus quest was as it <coughs> relaunched. I would want to say there are much better reasons than that as well, in that the whole Jewish dream of the time, which then the New Testament says has come true, is precisely of 
a God who doesn't stay detached from the world, but comes and gets his hands dirty in order to rescue the world. And that getting his hands dirty looks like Jesus, actually being a real person on the street, meeting people, healing people, being at risk, and finally getting crucified for his pains. Um, and unless we are prepared to do business with that, then it's not just, oh dear, we don't quite know who this Jesus is. We're actually distorting the central message of the New Testament before it even gets going. So it's possible if the church hadn't lost the historical Jesus, all these alternative false histories and even the Nazi, Nazi Jesus might never have found the market. I, I think that's, that's part of the question, certainly. And the question then for me is, at what point in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries did the church uh, stop really thinking about the Jewish meaning of Jesus in his own context and start simply talking about the divine son of God who does this and this and this, theologically speaking. And, and that, that's tricky because there are many teachers who do go back and retrieve early meanings. And some of the reformers, um, Luther and Calvin, translating the New Testament from the original sources um, into, into modern languages, they were going back behind the Middle Ages and saying we're retrieving the original meanings. Calvin particularly was very concerned about the Jewish and original Hebrew meanings, etc. But they were still operating within a framework of thought which made it hard for them to get what, I mean, it, it might sound arrogant to say we now know better than them. However, we do have now access to much better sources for what first century Judaism was all about than they did. And it seems to me that's where Jesus lived. That's where we have to go and meet him. Jesus, according to the letter of the Hebrews, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's find out the yesterday Jesus in order to know him today, in order to love him forever. That's, that all goes together. That's a great mission. Uh, well, can we actually trust the, the report of the New Testament writings? We've had the Jesus Seminar and other demythologizers clip away first Jesus' miracles, then his prophecies, then his divine self-identification. Uh, can we be reasonably sure that what he, that he said and did, what the New Testament authors tell us he said and did? And aren't these yeah. authors too biased to be trustworthy? Yes, um, clearly everyone who writes about anything is in that sense biased because there is no such thing as a point of view which is nobody's point of view. And once one says that, we, we can kind of all relax. You know, that, that When I go home from where I am now and tell my wife what's been going on, there are a thousand things that have happened to me that I won't bother mentioning to her because she'll say, it's really boring to be told that then you took your watch off or put it back on or had a sip of water or whatever. Cut out all that. So I select and I arrange in order for what will be meaningful and interesting to her. doesn't mean I'm falsifying it, just means I'm telling the story the way that a grown-up human being does, not, not a child, say. Um, in the same way the Gospel writers select and arrange to make particular points, everyone does that. Josephus, the Jewish historian, does that very obviously. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's the only way you can tell stories. But then what we have to do is to say, let's get to know the world that they're describing, the world of the Middle East in the first half of the first century AD as well as we can and see what these things would have meant then. And as we do that, we have to put aside some of the philosophical prejudices that make us say we will only accept as historical certain things which we with our 18th or 19th century blinders or blinkers on will accept. And the question of so-called miracles comes up there because of David Hume in the middle of the 18th century, who had this argument that you, you couldn't believe in miracles for all sorts of reasons, um, but particularly because we didn't see them in our own day, so we assume that they didn't happen then. Now, I would want to say to David Hume, um, I've been in pastoral ministry for 40 years, and I have seen things which I describe as miracles. And um, I know the people who the doctors said were about to die, who are now still alive, having had people praying for them. You know, so, so I'm sorry, strange things do happen. You may say it's coincidence, and fine, no doubt people said the same in Jesus' day. But, but then the problem is really ideological, that when people use the word miracle, and this is particularly so in modern North America, which has been um, based on the deism of the 18th century and the Epicureanism of Thomas Jefferson, we think of an absent God who occasionally reaches in and does something, then goes away again, and then, okay, that's a miracle. And a lot of people talk like that, but that's not how the New Testament sees it. For the New Testament and the Jews of the day, 
heaven and earth were always meant to be in business together, and that was always going to be strange and dangerous and unpredictable. And sometimes stuff happens where they say, God is really in our midst, God is really at work here, and something has happened which we didn't expect. That doesn't quite correspond to what we in the modern world mean by miracles. So there's a lot of questions to be addressed on that front, though there's one very important argument which the philosopher Colin Brown made some years ago, that in the Gospels we find people saying that Jesus was demon-possessed or that he was in league with Beelzebub. Now, we can be quite sure that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John didn't make that up. The early Christians didn't invent the idea of Jesus being called demon-possessed. But then you have to say, so why would people say Jesus was demon-possessed? And the answer is because he was doing stuff for which there was no other explanation unless you were going to believe that what he was talking about the kingdom of God was right. So actually, you have to say Jesus must have been doing some remarkable things, sufficiently remarkable to get that uh, insult thrown at him, and so on and so on. So there are good historical arguments once you learn to live in the world of the first century. This doesn't mean that I can now produce a proof of every verse in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And indeed, the idea of wanting to prove everything like that grows particularly out of modern North American rationalism, where um, the rationalists want to say either it's true or it's not true, almost as though, dare I say, it's a mathematical formula that, that we have, um, we are now going to prove, like somebody proving a, a theorem in, in geometry. Um, and that's not how history works. And that's why history always appears to a scientific rationalist, a bit risky. Can you actually be sure? And I want to say, no, history is real knowledge. We know that Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. We know that Jesus of Nazareth was executed by crucifixion. We know that 100 years later, there was a revolt led by somebody called um, uh, Simon Bar Kokhba, um, son of the star. And uh, we, we know that this is not open for debate. And within that, we know that Jesus went about announcing that this is the time for God to become king. We know that he did things which upset some people and excited others. We know that he was crucified. And we've got convergent reasons for saying we know that he rose from the dead. This is historical knowledge, not scientific knowledge, although there is actually a continuum between history and science. They are not completely opposed. But that would take us into an entire other lecture. Well, that makes sense. Uh, how about Jesus' prophetic statements or those sayings that imply a high Christology? Do they have a flavor of authentic history or, or yeah. are they inventions of the later church? Part of our problem about what we call high Christology, i.e. Jesus as fully divine, is that um, another of the features of the 18th century was to pull apart divinity and humanity. And that actually goes back a lot further than just the 18th century as well. But we have lived in the modern world in which if God is around, humans might not be, and vice versa, as though they're incompatible, which goes back to the Epicureanism, which says, there's the kingdom of heaven up there somewhere, it's totally different to earth, if it were to come to earth, it would result in earth being abolished. This is basically a modern form of certain types of ancient philosophy, and when we learn to think first century Jewishly, life is not like that at all. And the idea of God coming in person to do things though scary and perhaps dangerous, is not at all out with the bounds of, of possibility in terms of the way that first century Jews might think. And we see this peeping through in a number of places, not only in John's Gospel, as people used to say, but actually in Matthew, Mark and Luke as well. And the way it peeps through looks as if it all goes back to an original burst of creative energy, actually, which you would have to say, that looks like Jesus himself. Part of our difficulty is that when we Christians today want to say, I think Jesus was and is divine or the Son of God or whatever, we've often meant that actually in a docetic fashion, that is to say that he only seems to be human and isn't human really. And it's hard for us to imagine what it'd be like for a Jesus who really did believe that what Israel's God had said in prophecy, he would do himself, this was a vocation to which Jesus had to be obedient, that he had to do and say things which would only make sense if he was embodying Yahweh. For instance, in returning to Jerusalem in Luke 19, he talks about uh, the judgment that is coming upon the city because he says, you didn't know the time of your visitation. And he tells a story about a king who's gone away and who comes back. 
in order to illustrate what's now happening, that Yahweh having abandoned the temple is now at last coming to confront present Jerusalem um, and to say, this is the moment, are you ready for it? And so Jesus has ways of re-inhabiting the prophetic tradition, which don't quite conform to the modern idea that if he was divine, that means he had to go around sort of saying, hey guys, I, I'm the son of God, better believe in me. That, that's a modern Christian docetic caricature. We have to strip that away, not in order to deny the divinity of Jesus, but in order to rediscover the genuine meaning of divinity within the Jesus who's actually there in the texts. So in other words, we are looking for wrong things if we are asking for Jesus to say, I am God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we are not looking at the right things. That, that's absolutely right. And in, say, Mark 14, when uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, says, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? Part of our difficulty is that the word Christ, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Many Christians have assumed that the word Christ means the second person of the Trinity rather than Messiah. And Jesus' answer brings together Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, which were both interesting, creative, difficult texts at the time, but which both seem to be talking about somebody, a human figure, who shares the very throne of God. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What would it mean for a human being to sit at God's right hand? Does this mean there are now two gods? Clearly not. And that, that's a question which other Jews at the time were asking about those texts. And it looks as though Jesus is almost teasingly saying, guess what, this is how those texts are coming true. And that's much more subtle and much more Jewish than our modern interpretations would normally suggest. I see. And didn't they have the problem the other way around in the first Christian centuries? Uh, weren't there several heresies that didn't deny Jesus true humanity? Oh yes, absolutely. They, they didn't have any problem with his divinity. Absolutely, because there were many movements which would be quite happy with sort of different levels of divine being or whatever. And that's why John's Gospel is so important. The word became flesh. And the word sarx is, is a kind of a crunchy, this-worldly word. It's like in John 6 when Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. And the word he uses for eat in John 6 is trogo, which means to munch, to chew, unless, you know, which is, or deliberately stressing the physical uh, in a way which is almost shocking to us. Well, can we really in this day and age believe that Jesus physically rose from his grave? Are there good reasons for a non-believer to become convinced of this claim. <laughs> yes, it's funny that you say in this day and age, because uh, I've met this often, the implication that people only discovered that dead people don't rise at some point in the last 200 years. Um, I was once doing a, a television debate with um, a skeptical scholar who said, we know that the body of Jesus has rotted in the tomb. We, and I said, how do you know this? He said, I have 200 years of scientific historiography on my side. And I said, 200 years? Homer knew that the dead don't rise. Plato knew that. Socrates knew that. Seneca knew that. This is not something that the modern science has discovered. Um, Some people seem to think that every truth is discovered by looking at the clock and the calendar. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and the garden and a few other modern inventions. Um, quite. And, and so it, the early Christians knew perfectly well that what they were saying about Jesus made no sense whatever in their world any more than it does in ours. You know, the, the, the central Christian claim always was something that everyone making it knew would be like, are you stupid? Have you been smoking something? Or what, what's, what's wrong with you? And yet they said it. Um, so we, we shouldn't imagine that it was easy for them to believe because they were first century people who didn't know the laws of nature, whereas it's hard for us poor modern people because we now do know the laws of nature. That, that's, that's just modernist rubbish. Um, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus I see as convergent when you look at the Jewish world of Jesus' day, which we know quite well. We know about what people thought about death and life after death, and some people believed in resurrection and people actually coming back after having been dead. Um, and we also know in the early church how they conceived of their future life after death. And it's very interesting because all the early Christians known to us had a view of resurrection which is like the Jewish view, but developed in various, very specific ways for which there was no precedent in the Jewish world, but which all make sense once you say, well, they all thought that this was what had happened to Jesus. So that just to give you one example, 
In the Jewish world, some visions of resurrection, like in Daniel 12, are of the righteous shining like stars. Well, in the Gospels, the stories of the risen Jesus don't have him shining like a star. Other stories about resurrection, like in 2 Maccabees 7, imagine people just getting back the same body that they've got, as though you just have to live this life all over again. Whereas Jesus in the Gospels is not instantly recognized. He has the mark of the nails, but he seems to be a little bit different. And then Paul and the others theorize this by talking about a transformed physicality, as though his body has gone not just back into the same life, like a sort of Groundhog Day thing, but actually on beyond death into a new sort of physicality for which there was no precedent, but which now seems to be strangely at home in heaven as well as on earth, which really shatters our modern platonic assumptions. So when you say, why did they have ideas like that? Why did they develop such strange things? They all say, because Jesus himself rose from the dead, and that is the prototype of what resurrection is like. So then the historian has to say, do we have any other explanation? for why Christianity began in the first place and took the shape it did. You see, there are so many other Jewish movements of the time which ended with the violent death of the founder. Now, granted that, you've got a choice. You either give up the revolution and skate back home and hope you get away with your skin, or you get a new leader. You don't go around saying, oh, God's raised him from the dead. We, we've got examples of movements which did the one or did the other. And the only one which went around saying, actually, God has raised our chap from the dead is Christianity. So it breaks the mold. And that, again, forces the question, how are you going to cope with that? Now, at this point, the rationalist Christians want to say, uh, OK, here is the argument. Ding, 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 ding. Therefore, Jesus must have been raised from the dead. And if you don't believe it, you're either stupid or wicked or both. And, and that there is always the danger with the rationalist apologetic that it comes out with that feel. And some people have accused me of saying that, though I've, I've never actually done that. So I want to say that the, the historical argument takes you to the point where you realize there are worldview issues involved, um, where it isn't a matter of saying, oh, I've got good historical reasons for saying Jesus didn't rise, because it, all the evidence suggests that he did. And then you have to say, now the question is, might there be a creator God who loves this world so much that he wants to rescue and renew and restore it? And if you're prepared at least to face that question and say, that's what this would be about if it were to be the case, then all sorts of other things open up. So I want an apologetic, if you like, which includes the historical argument, but not as though that's the only, uh, the only road in there's all sorts of other things as well going on, and that's where the entire mission of the church comes in, to live in such a way that it shows that it actually makes sense to think that there is a new creation. And once people see that it might make sense, that there is a new way to live, a new way to be human, then the rational arguments come and say, there you are, that's where we were pointing. But you can't necessarily get there on rationalism alone. I see. The flavor of authenticity comes from the fact that the descriptions of the risen Jesus don't don't resemble the Old Testament. This uh, is the funny thing. This is the funny thing. There are a few pictures of resurrection in the Old Testament. Daniel 12, Ezekiel 37, Isaiah 24. Not very much. And there's a bit more in the intertestamental period. But again, not very much. And even in the rabbis much later, there's some speculation, but not very much. Um, so it really does look as though the gospel accounts of the risen Jesus were not generated by people saying he must have been raised. What would that look like? Well, we have a text which tells us. In yeah. fact, they were ransacking They're their Bibles. grasping for words. Hmm? They're rather grasping for words that, to that, describe exactly, something that exactly. they actually witnessed. The, the, the great uh, American scholar of this last generation, Ed Sanders, who I think is only on the edge of Christian faith himself, he says at one point, it looks as though they were trying very hard to say something for which they knew they didn't have very good language. And I think that's exactly right. One of my favorite lines in John's Gospel is when John says, none of them dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Now, isn't that odd? You, know, you and I have known each other for two days, but if I met you in the corridor in five minutes' time, I wouldn't say, who are you? Because we've been together. Mm -hmm. uh, they had been with Jesus for three years, um, and yet they wanted to say, who are you? He, he seemed to be the same and yet different. That, that's a fascinating thing, which I think they would never have made up.
Probably not. But could the disciples just have hallucinated the meetings? They knew about hallucinations. Isn't mm -hmm. that interesting that uh, we think hallucinations is a modern invention? Actually, the ancient world is full of hallucinations and reports of them, particularly of somebody who has recently died. And this is widely reported in the ancient and the modern world that sometimes when somebody dies, somebody who they have loved or who's been close to them will see them fleetingly. It's happened in, in, in my own family um, 30 years ago and in other families that I've known have reported the same thing. And they knew about this in the ancient world. Now, the key example for me is in Acts 12 where Peter is in jail, Herod wants to have him killed, and then the church is praying for his release. Peter gets out of jail, comes and knocks on the door, and they say it must be his angel, mm -hmm. which means they think he has been killed, and this is a post-mortem hallucination, a ghost, an angel, whatever, coming to say goodbye, and that is totally compatible with going to the prison the next morning, getting the body and burying it. Mm -hmm. What it's not saying is, there's an empty tomb, he's alive, he's around somewhere. That's what happens with Jesus. If you'd only had sightings of the risen Jesus without an empty tomb, they would never have said resurrection. If you'd only had an empty tomb without sightings, they would never have said resurrection. It takes both to generate that belief. Well, the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus has lately received much positive support from you and other scholars. Has your research uncovered some new, de new details or information that has previously gone unnoticed? Or are you just connecting straws and... Yeah, or... it's a good question. I think, I think in some ways what I've done is to, to, to collect all kinds of material that has been scattered around various other things. When I wrote that big book on the resurrection, the resurrection of the Son of God, I originally expected that it would be between two and three hundred pages long. The reason it's between seven and eight hundred pages long is that the more I read what other people had written about resurrection ideas, life after death ideas, the New Testament, the Jewish world, the Gnostic world, the more I kept seeing, to be blunt, mistakes being made, people misdescribing what the texts were saying. So at every point I had to clean up what was going on. Um, for instance, the, the, the Maccabees stories, people, one scholar describes the belief in resurrection in Second Maccabees as these are people who are interpreting death as resurrection. I remember being really cross when I read that. They are not interpreting death as resurrection. They are saying that yes, we are dying and then there will be resurrection. Resurrection is the defeat of death. It's not the redescription of death. But there has been so much misinformation or even disinformation on all the related subjects that I really found I had to use all my philosophical linguistic training to clean the stuff up and then to say now let's reassemble the package and see where we get and in the course of doing so I've been forced to reflect methodologically on what sort of a thing you're doing when you're arguing for belief in the resurrection and that's why I'm distancing myself both from the rationalism which says we will just produce this argument and it's like a a scientific formula and you've got to believe it and from the romanticism which says you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart because somebody can say well good luck to you but he doesn't live within mine and that's the end of the conversation you know, th th there is a much larger whole which is the, the task of the whole church within which certain things make sense in a way that they don't otherwise so in other words there was so much good, unused, or misrepresented information <laughs> that there was no need to dig into any new information. Well, I, I wouldn't quite put it like that because I did find myself digging in all sorts of funny places that I hadn't expected to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when I wrote subsequently the book Surprised by Hope, um, that I, I went into all sorts of areas there that I was just following my nose into different bits of literature and, and, and stuff, which was fascinating and uh, very exciting, actually. Okay. Uh, well, could you name, say, three areas where the church at large most needs to have her mind to be renewed with the invigorating truth of Jesus' resurrection? In other words, what implications of this matchless historical event would be the most pressing right now in our world? Okay, uh, you say three, and um, the, the obvious two for me, and then I'll probably think of a third one while, while I'm saying the first two. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I say at the end of Surprise by Hope. Um, the two areas particularly are beauty and justice because um, if we believe that with Jesus' resurrection God's new creation has been launched 
which is what it's all about. I mean, okay, let's take a step back. So many people think that if the resurrection happened, it's just a very odd event within the present world. You, you have to believe this is a crazy miracle. Well, it is a very odd event within the real world, but the point is it is the paradigmatic event in God's new creation. And once you see that, then in order to talk about it, to celebrate it, the church has to be a community of new creation. So if the church is denying beauty, if the church is not giving a place for the arts, for music, for drama, for all the things which celebrate the beauty and power of life, as well as the poignancy and sorrow of life, then it's no surprise if our arguments for the resurrection fall on deaf ears because people can't see and feel that something is going on here. You know, I really believe it's easier for somebody to believe in the resurrection if they have just sung through a performance of Handel's Messiah than, than if they haven't, you know, because that, that creates a narrative world, but which is also a world of real beauty within which, yes, this would make sense, of course. And the other one is justice, that if God is putting the world right, starting with Jesus' body itself, then unless the church is seen to be active in the work of doing what we can to bring God's justice to the world, even in the present time, why should anyone believe us if we talk about a new creation which has begun with Jesus? So beauty and justice then hold the task of evangelism in between them, as it were, that when you are doing beauty and celebrating beauty, when you are doing justice and working for it and praying and campaigning for it, then to talk about God raising Jesus from the dead makes a sense that it will never make if you are not doing those things. That makes sense, and they both rise directly from the resurrection. Absolutely, and I've had, I, I've spoken about this in various churches and various places, and I've had artists particularly, but also musicians, come up to me afterwards, sometimes in tears, to say, I've been a member of this church for 20 years, and nobody has the slightest idea why what I do matters, and you have just given me a map on which my vocation makes sense. And that, that to me is really exciting. I mean, I'm not an artist, I'm a musician, but to, to, to see artists, as it were, coming to life with that vision is tremendous. Would you say that the power of the narrative context for the resurrection and understanding it comes from the fact that in this postmodern society we have destroyed all the great meta narratives and we are longing for a real yeah yeah powerful uh, that that is undoubtedly the case but it's interesting that, that yes in postmodernity we have knocked out the big meta narratives and in many cases a good job too the trouble with that is that you throw out the teapot with the tea bag, as it were, um, and you miss the fact that the greatest narrative of all, which is the biblical narrative, is not a power story. Um, people like um, uh, Leotard and the other postmodernists are objecting to the power narratives, the narratives which instantiate human political power. The biblical narrative is a love story. It's not a power story. Uh, at least it carries a power, but it's the power of self-giving love, which is the reverse of ordinary human power. Um, so yes, when the church is living out the love story, then the whole narrative makes sense. You know, if, if, you're, if you're living that story as the church in mission and in working with the poor and in all the other things that the church is supposed to do, um, then you get the whole Bible back and it becomes your book in a whole new way. Hmm. Well, let's move to another smaller but uh, nevertheless interesting topic. Uh, in your scholarly opinion, how did the early recipients of the Genesis creation account understand what they heard and read? How much of it would they have taken as what we call historical reporting? And how certain can we be of this interpretation and on what basis? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not really equipped to answer it particularly because that would demand an expertise in ancient Near Eastern culture which I don't have. So I'm merely going on second and third hand things of what I've read from other scholars whose opinion I respect. I assume with most scholars today that the Pentateuch as we have it, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, was put together into its present final form sometime during the Babylonian exile. That doesn't mean that some or all of it or lots of it wasn't written a long time before that, but it looks as though it's been edited into a final form and then brought back to Jerusalem probably by Ezra um, when some of the exiles return after 
the, the central bit of the Babylonian exile. So I, I'm not an expert on ancient Babylonian religion, so I don't know about how they would have read it there. I'm not an expert on ancient Hittite or other earlier religions. But what I hear from reading many people who are experts is that it would be clear to anyone in that wider culture that the sevenfold structure of uh, the, the, the creation of the world and the way you get a three and a three and a one, as it were, um, that, that uh, all, all of that resonates with the idea of building a temple which is a heaven and earth reality a temple which has an image at its heart, a temple which is where the God, the divinity, wants to come and take his ease, take his rest, to be at home. So that the primary thing would be to say, there is a good God who made this world, and it's a good world, and it is made to be a dwelling place for himself. Not that heaven and earth are identical, but they're meant for each other, they're meant to work together. That is so counterintuitive in the modern world, that in the 19th century, many people forgot about the heaven bit and simply wanted to know, is this a sort of scientific account? Does this just tell us about the facts on the ground? And the answer is that that's asking the wrong question. Um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's not what, this, what these narratives were written to discuss, to talk about. And certainly not to talk about um, seven days of 24 hours, which is problematic anyway, because until the sun is created, how do we know what 24 hours would be, and so on and so on. So um, people sometimes say it's poetry. Well, it's not quite like other Hebrew poetry, but it's more like the poetic imagination of saying, here, let me tell you what this world really is, once upon a time, etc., etc. It's, it's that sort of a story, but it emphasizes the goodness of creation the role of humans within it, and the fact that creation is designed to be a heaven and earth compound in which God desires to dwell. And that's why, work back, when the tabernacle is made in Exodus 40, well, completed and filled with the divine presence in Exodus 40, and when Solomon builds and dedicates the temple in um, 1 Kings 7 and 8, then these are reflections of the creation and little working models of where the creation is going, of the new creation which is to come, which then goes all the way forward to the New Testament's idea of the new genesis of the new creation. That's a marvelous idea. So we shouldn't be looking for a clash between science and uh, the creation heaven. No, it's, I sigh deeply because this is particularly an American problem at the moment. It's very interesting that few Christians outside the great debates in America over the last two centuries worry about um, Darwin and science and religion in the way that the Americans do. It's, it, uh, but, but, but the Americans have made this a problem which they're determined to go on um, dividing their culture over, and it's become part of the American culture wars. And, and I, one of my minor missions in life is to rem I remind my dear American friends that uh, they shouldn't export their culture wars to the rest of the world, thank you very much. We've got other problems, we don't need theirs. Um, and it's very interesting, if you look at the 19th century in Britain, for instance, there are many devout Christians who are perfectly happy to say, well, maybe Darwin has told us roughly how God did it. That was how um, this extraordinary thing of creation was done. It doesn't mean you have to say science or religion. And that polarization is itself part of the fact value um, polarization or the history of faith polarization, which is a feature of 18th century culture, which has sustained on through to today, but which has very little purchase in other cultures um, in the rest of the world to this day, but certainly in previous periods of history. It's funny how we forget everything other earlier generations knew mm. and then repeat their... Precisely. C.S. Lewis talks about new learning and new ignorance. Yeah. Well, moving to our final topic. Is Christian ethics primarily about obeying God's commandments? And are those commandments meant to be understood like a legal text? Is the idea of virtue ethics somehow connected in, in the Christian faith, or to the Christian faith? And is it enough for a Christian to read, for example, Aristotle and follow his conceptions of virtues? <laughs> I'd much rather contemporary Christians read Aristotle than that they didn't, because I think Aristotle uh, has a lot of very wise things to say about what we might call character formation. 
that you, you, you become good by doing good things, by practicing. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you can quickly pull back and go to Paul and say, hang on, we believe in justification by faith and that sounds like good works. And I would say that Paul himself talks about character formation, not as somebody from outside coming into the Christian faith, but now that you're in the Christian faith, this is how you should practice it. And by practice, I would mean like you practice a musical instrument. If you want to learn to play the piano, you can't sit down and play Beethoven straight off. You have to start with the easy things, the scales and so on, and gradually, bit by bit, your teacher will build you up to that. Um, or if you practice a, a game, if you learn to play tennis, you can't just go and play like Roger Federer straight off. You've got to practice this shot, that shot, how to stand and so on. And gradually things become what we call second nature. And for Aristotle, that always involves an individual making themselves somebody very special, a very special individual human being. And for Aristotle, that is usually about producing a good citizen or a good military leader. In the New Testament, it's always a team sport. You can't do it by yourself. And you can see this with the great new virtues that are introduced in Christianity, which are patience, humility, chastity, and charity. Nobody in the ancient world thought that that set of things was worth aiming at. In fact, they were seen as foolishness or weakness. The Christians said, no, there is a new way to be human and you will need to practice these things because the rest of the world doesn't believe they're possible. It's like the rest of the world doesn't believe resurrection is possible because they don't believe new creation is possible. But these are the ways we have to practice to be new creation people. Now, of course, rules matter because while you're learning the virtues, it's like somebody learning to drive. It's helpful if there's a guardrail so that if you swing off the road, you won't kill yourself and other people. The rules are like that. They're saying, oh, goodness, we just crunched into something. Oh, that's because I wasn't being careful about this or that. But ideally, there is an aim that by the Spirit, through the life of prayer and faith, one becomes the sort of person who will naturally live in a certain way. There are dangers to talking about it like that. I think there are even more dangers about not talking about it like that. Possibly, yes. So the goal is to become a member of new humanity. Absolutely. Renewed well, in Jesus. The, the, the goal is already given. In baptism and faith, you are already a new person. But now, okay, you've got to put on these clothes, Paul says. You've got to clothe yourselves with humility and faith and patience and so on. And the fruit of the Spirit, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, faith, faithfulness, kindness, goodness, self-control, um, uh, these things, again, don't happen automatically. If somebody says, I, I have got the Spirit, um, and now it just seems that God isn't bothered about making me gentle or kind or patient or whatever. The answer is no. If the Spirit is dwelling in you, you have to be intentional. The Spirit renews your mind. Here's the thing about Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind. It doesn't bypass, it can bypass the mind, but usually doesn't. You have to think out, who am I becoming in this situation? What steps do I have to take? to make it easier for me to become the person that I am already given to be in Christ. That's the dynamic of the Christian life. So become who you were born to be like. Become who you were newly created to be, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Marvelous. That seems like a lot better foundation for moral behavior than just trying to follow a list of rules. It, it does. It doesn't make it easier. In some ways it makes it harder because you realize just what a responsibility you have. Um, but there are encouragements on the way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for thank this you. interview, Professor. Thank Ryan. you very much. Thank you.